Shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha Kodash. Double honors to the elders and the apostles of Great Millstone, and peace and blessings to the elect. And today we're going to go into the book of Bell and the Dragon, <clears throat> which um, is also, I believe, just one chapter long. Um, yeah, so um, similar to the book of Susanna. And the reason I'm going through these, uh, you know, these books now is like I mentioned in, in that video, um, the one that I did yesterday, is that these also are occurring, you know, right around that same time period, you know, of Daniel and Ezekiel and so on and so forth. So trying to keep them all uh, sort of in sync. Now, <clears throat> with the um, with Bell and the Dragon, you know, as we went through, the, those events transpired, you know, a little before Daniel, the first chapter, before Daniel got called into the court of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, although they were still captives in Babylon at this time. Now, in Bell and the Dragon, you know, as we're about to read, this this probably occurred maybe um, somewhere between or somewhere a little before what we're reading here in Daniel 10, since in um, Daniel the 10th chapter, Daniel is mentioning uh, the, the third year of Cyrus, right, king of Persia. And as we read in the ninth chapter, <clears throat> he mentions uh, Darius, right? So, um, you know, we'll go into to basically what's going on here, but what happens in Bell and the Dragon, this is more so after, um, after, uh, 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 you know, Nebuchadnezzar's time and all of that. Okay, this is this is way after that. So at this point, you know, the Daniel has already been in in the court of Nebuchadnezzar for a, a good while now. You know, and as a matter of fact, uh, he's been there. He's probably a little. He's probably much older now. He's probably like an old man at this point, right? Because he's lived through the the, the reigns of all the different Babylonian kings, even up until. Um, uh, what's this guy's name? <clears throat> uh, Belshazzar, okay, which we read in Daniel the fifth chapter, and now he's lived through the reign of the the Persians. Because remember, the Persians took down the um, the uh, the Babylonians, okay, the Neo Babylonian Empire, and we're gonna read an account here just to get a bit of context, okay? But you know, Cyrus, which was the king at the time. You know had basically led this campaign and they, they took down the um, you know they took down the Babylonians and that region of Babylon was given to to uh, Darius the Mede okay now Darius the Mede in Daniel the fifth chapter in secular history is known as Astyages okay and that's why we're gonna go into a bit of history about that as to you know it helps to understand what was his relationship with Cyrus Okay, because Astyages was a Median and Cyrus was a Persian. Um, but but nevertheless, we'll, we'll go into that anyway. So, the, the context of Bell and the Dragon right now is Daniel, you know, he's, he's lived through the Babylonian, you know, empire. The Babylonian empire has gone down. Um, he lived through the reign of Darius, you know, which was, who was uh, Darius the, the Mede, who was um, older by the time he was, you know, reigning in Babylon. So... After he died, then Cyrus basically recouped that dominion back and, um, you know, reigned over there. So at that at this point in time is when um, we're reading of this story here. OK, so <clears throat> let's start off. This is the book of Bell and the Dragon, chapter one, verse one. And King Astyages was gathered to his fathers. Now, keep in mind, this Astyages is the same as Darius the Mede, right, that Daniel mentions here in Daniel 9 and 1, in the first reign of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, which uh, of the seed of the Medes, right? Which this Ahasuerus is referring to um, the father of Darius, which was Cyaxares. So in other words, Darius, historically known as Astyages, the son of Ahasuerus, historically known as Cyaxares, of the seed of the Medes, because they were Medians, uh, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon. Okay, so going back to Bell and the Dragon, after that reign, uh, and he died, right, after Darius the Mede or Astyages died, 
which when it says he was gathered to his fathers, it means he died. So after he was gathered to his fathers and Cyrus of Persia received his kingdom. So basically after, you know, um, Styges died, Cyrus just basically uh, uh, took, took uh, jurisdiction of that, that region again. Now, <clears throat> when you look up Astyages in uh, online, okay, this is a little bit about him, um, which, like I said, this is important context to understand. Okay, so it says here, Astyages was the last king of the Median kingdom, reigning from 585 to 550 BCE, the son of Cyaxares. So that's why in Daniel 9, though it's translated as a Hasuerus, this is not talking about Xerxes. It's not talking about the, the Persian king who married Esther. This is a different individual here because that individual uh, Xerxes was a Persian. Here it's referring to them as Medes. So um, it says here, son of Cyaxares, he was dethroned by the Persian king Cyrus the Great. <clears throat> Astyages succeeded his father in 585 BCE following the Battle of Halus which ended a five-year war between the Lydians and the Medes. He inherited a large empire, ruled in alliance with his two brothers-in-laws, Croesus of Lydia and Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Now, you may be wondering, uh, how is Nebuchadnezzar the brother-in-law of Astyages? Which I think it will tell us a bit here. It says, whose wife, uh, Amethyst, Astyages' sister, was the queen of for whom Nebuchadnezzar was said to have built the hanging gardens of Babylon. So going back in time a little bit, when we go back to the reign of the Assyrians, right, the Assyrian Empire, these, <coughs> the same Assyrians that deported the northern kingdom out of their land and took them to Assyria, right, the bulk of them. At the point of the collapse of the Assyrian Empire, that was by the hand of the Babylonians, as well as the Medes, okay, working together. And um, as a matter of fact, let me pull up Fall of Neo-Assyrian Empire. So they were working together, <clears throat> and um, the Babylonians were being led by Nebuchadnezzar's father, which whose name was, uh, I, I believe that was Nabopolassar. Now he, by nationality, was an actual Assyrian, but he was reigning over Babylon. And he basically had revolted against the, the Assyrian Empire. And he got help from the Medes. Okay, so they basically worked together to um, to take down the Assyrian Empire. And I, I want to see if they have... Uh, I want to see if they have a bit of context here. I could just tell you, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's good to see it for yourself. Um... Uh, Okay, long story short, like I said, you can do the research more for yourself, but <clears throat> going back in time a little bit. So at the fall of the Assyrian Empire, you had the Babylonians, which were led by Nabopolassar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar II. And you had the Medes, which were led by um, Cyaxares, which was the father of Astyages. Okay, so they basically formed an alliance by marriage. And that alliance was solidified, saying, Nabopolassar, king of Babylon at this time, says, um, I'm going to give you my son, Nebuchadnezzar, right? I'm going to have him marry your daughter. So Nabopolassar, king of Babylon, Cyaxeres, king of uh, the Medes at this point, make a deal to say, We're, we both want to take down the Assyrians. So uh, let's have our children get married. So Nebuchadnezzar marries um, Amethyst, which is the daughter of the Median king Cyaxares. And so now they have this alliance and they work together to take down the, um, the uh, Assyrian Empire. So when, when we read about the Babylonian Empire coming up and reigning and all of that, they were sort of reigning simultaneously with the Median Empire. Like they didn't go back and forth with each other because they had an alliance. But it was through this alliance that um, Nebuchadnezzar is now the brother-in-law of Astyages. Because remember, Astyages was the son of Cyaxares. Astyages' sister is Amethyst, the one that Nebuchadnezzar married. So this is how they're, they're 
basically a brother-in-law and so on and so forth. But um, <clears throat> so continuing, it says here, uh, and, and when you read about the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, that was what um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar built for his wife, Amethyst, um, because I believe she was feeling like homesick or, or so. So he basically built that for her. Anyway, married to uh, Arines, the sister of the Lydian king, um, Croesus, to seal the treaty between the two empires, Astyages ascended to the Median throne upon his father's death later that year. Now, the part I'm really looking for is this part right here in Her Herodotus. Now, this gives an account of um, Astyages and what his relationship is to Cyrus, because he is actually the grandfather of, uh, of Cyrus. Okay. <clears throat> and that connection is through um, Astyages' daughter. Okay. So the mo Cyrus, the Persian, his mother was a Median. She was also the daughter of Astyages. Okay. So Cyrus is the grandson of Astyages through his mother's side. And this is the account of it. Now, it says here, <clears throat> in Herodotus, the account given by the ancient Greek historian Herodotus relates that Astyages had a dream in which his daughter, Mandane, gave birth to a son who would destroy his empire. Fearful of the dream's prophecy, Astyages married her off to Cambyses of Anshan, who had a reputation for being a quiet and thoughtful prince and whom Astyages believed to be no threat. Now, <clears throat> you often hear Medes and the Persians together, like Medo-Persian Empire or something like that. And basically what would happen is when the Medes were ruling, that empire consisted of Medes and Persians. However, the ruling class were the Medes. And when it flipped vice versa and the Persians were ruling, the empire consisted of Persians, and you also had Medes up in there, but the ruling class were the Persians. Okay, so <clears throat> what Astyages did, being the king of the Median Empire at this time, and having this dream that his, his daughter's son, his grandson, would basically destroy his kingdom, he decided, and this was before, um, before his daughter uh, had, had given birth to a son. So after having this dream, he said, all right, I'm going to marry my daughter off to Cambyses the first. He was a Persian king. And the reason he did that was because Cambyses, like we just read here, was believed to be quiet and thoughtful. So he's he, he's thinking he can avert this dream if he marries his daughter to a king that is basically harmless. Right. <clears throat> because their son would just, you know, he would come out and he wouldn't he wouldn't be, uh, you know, somebody of the nature to, to take down and destroy his, his, his kingdom. So it says here, when a second dream warned Astyages of the dangers of Mandane's offspring, Astyages sent his general Harpagus to kill the, uh, kill the child Cyrus. So uh, he marries off his daughter to this Persian king, who he believes is no threat, calm, chill guy. They have a child, which is Cyrus, and that is... Um, Astyages' grandson. Now we know that the, the the child takes the you know his lineage goes back through his father. So Cyrus is a Persian because his father Cambyses was a Persian. Okay, but Cyrus's mother is a Median because her father is Astyages who is a Mede. So now Cyrus is born. Astyages has another dream that says, "Yo, this guy is going. He's still going to take down your kingdom." And now he's like, uh-uh, I'm, I'm not doing this. So he sends his general, his general Harpagus to basically go and find Cyrus and kill him. Now it says here, Herodotus correctly names Cyrus's parents, though he fails to mention that Cambyses was a king. Modern scholarship generally rejects his claim that Cyrus was the grandson of Astyages. So, and this is what you'll find often in... Uh, when you read about secular history, there's always differing opinions. You know, some people believe this, some people believe that. Some people don't believe this, some people don't believe that. Um, <clears throat> so you just take the parts that, that are helpful to you and you keep it pushing. Harpagus, unwilling to spill royal blood, gave the infant to a shepherd, Mithridates, 
whose wife had just given birth to a stillborn child. So he gets sent on this mission to go assassinate Cyrus. <coughs> He's like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not killing nobody of royalty. So instead, he basically is deceptive and swaps out the children. He sees this farmer, right, or this shepherd, who has a stillborn, and he says, okay, I'm going to give you this, this child, you take care of him, and I'm going to take your stillborn, and go and present it to the king as if, hey, look, the job is done. So it says, Cyrus was raised as Mithridates' own son, and Harpagus presented the stillborn child to Astyages as the dead Cyrus. When Cyrus was found alive at age 10, Astyages spared the boy on the advice of his magi, returning him to his parents in Anshan. Harpagus, however, did not escape punishment, as Astyages is said to have fed him his own son at a banquet. So when Astyages the king found out that his general hadn't done what he asked, you know, he decided not to kill his grandson, but he punished his general by killing the general's son and feeding it to him in a banquet. Now, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. Anyway, Cyrus succeeded his father in 559 and, um, and in 553 on the advice of Harpagus, who was eager for revenge for being given the abominable supper, Cyrus rebelled against Astyages. After three, <coughs> three years of fighting, Astyages' troops mutinied during the Battle of Persargadi, and Cyrus conquered the Median's empire. So basically, the, the dream that Astyages had came true, where his grandson Cyrus ended up taking over his empire. Astyages was spared by Cyrus, and despite being taunted by Harpagus, Herodotus says he was treated well and remained in Cyrus's court until his death. So Harpagus, which was his general, he was, he was still bitter about what Astyages had done to him. So as revenge, he basically helped Cyrus, which was the grandson, to uh, take over the, the, the or overthrow Astyages. Um, and now, like we just read, when Cyrus took down the Median Empire, Astyages, his grandfather, was at his mercy, but he didn't kill him, right? Uh, this account at least says he kept him in his court until his death. Now, what we read of in Daniel 5, all right, says that uh, um, when the Babylonian Empire was taken down, now the Babylonian Empire was taken down after uh, Cyrus has, or has already taken down um, the Median kingdom, right? Now, it says that after it was taken down, it says Darius, I think, it, uh, see if we can go there real quick. Daniel 5. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 5, verse, the last verse, right? It says, or at least the 30th verse. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. This Darius the Median is the Astyages <coughs> that we're reading of here, a.k.a. the grandfather of Cyrus. Now, keep in mind, at this point in time, when Babylon is taken down, it is taken down by the Persian Empire. The king of the Persian Empire right now is Cyrus. Okay? But, when you read about this, this uh, region here, and you look into the word, I believe, took, right? It says da Darius the Median took uh, the kingdom. The word here is uh, Kobal. And as it says here, is to receive. Okay, so <clears throat> being that Cyrus was the king here, and as we're reading of in secular history, after he had taken over uh, his grandfather's kingdom, he didn't kill his grandfather. So what what basically happens here is after they had taken over Babylon, he basically gave that jurisdiction of Babylon to his grandfather Astyages, aka Darius the Mede, to reign over it. You know, and that's why it says here that Darius took the kingdom. So he basically got jurisdiction over that portion, you know, to reign over it. And this Babylon was a province, you could say, right, under the whole uh, Persian Empire at this point. Uh, so let's let's wrap up here. It says, um, uh, yeah, I think the main the main point we have there is is done. So that's why going back to Bell and the Dragon, the first chapter, it says here, and King Astyages was gathered to his fathers because he was already old at this point. 
So after he had died, because Cyrus basically gave him the portion of Babylon to reign over, and after he had died, Cyrus just basically took that portion back. As it says, he received his kingdom. And <clears throat> verse 2, and Daniel, so now continuing in Bell and the Dragon, now you have a bit of context as to who is Cyrus, who is Astyages, what was the relationship between the two, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So verse 2, it says, and Daniel conversed with the king and was honored above all his friends. Remember, at this point, Daniel is, is, you know, he's pretty up in age, right? He was a youth at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, but now he's lived through Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, all the kings that came after up until the Persians now. <clears throat> Verse 3, now the Babylonians, which it says the Babylons, but it really should be the Babylonians, had an idol called Bel or Baal, and there they and there were spent upon him every day 12 great measures of fine flour and 40 sheep and six vessels of wine. So this was the daily provisions that were made for this idol. <laughs> and the king worshipped it and went daily to adore it. So they had a temple for this idol and every day they would bring all this food there and the king, like it says, which was Cyrus, he would go and worship it and adore it. But Daniel worshipped his own God. And the king said unto Daniel, Why dost why does not thou worship Bel? Who answered and said, Because I may not worship idols made with hands, but the living God, who hath created the heaven and the earth, and hath sovereignty over all flesh. Then said the king unto him, Thinkest thou not that Bel is a living God? Seest thou not how much he eateth and drinketh every day? So what, what you trying to say? Bell, Bell ain't a living God? <laughs> you don't see all the food we put there every day and yet it's gone, right? So he's eating, so he must be living. Then Daniel smiled <laughs> and said, O king, be not deceived, for this is but clay within and brass without, and did never eat or drink anything. So he's saying, look, <laughs> you know, don't, don't fall for that, man. Like this idol is literally just they made it with clay and brass. It's it's not eating or drinking anything. It's literally just just an idol. So the king was wroth and called his priests and said unto them, If ye tell me not who <coughs> who this is that devoureth these expenses, ye shall die. But if ye can certify me that Bel devoureth them, then Daniel shall die, for he hath spoken blasphemy against Bel. And Daniel said unto the king, Let it be according to thy word. So now the king, he got he got mad. What the fuck? What? Wait, hold on. So you're trying to say that <laughs> somebody's been eating this food and it's not actually Bell, this idol? Well, you you better you better hope that's the case, because if not, you're gonna die. Because those are some blasphemous words. But if that is the case, then whoever been doing it, man, they <laughs> yeah, they 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 gonna they gonna they gonna die. Verse 10. Now the priests of Bel were three score and ten, which is seventy, beside their wives and children, meaning seventy of them not counting their wives and children. And the king went with Daniel into the temple of Bel. So Bel's priest said, Lo, we go out, but thou, O king, set on the meal and make ready the wine, and shut the door fast and seal it with thine own signet. So basically, look, we all in here, right? You're going to see us leave, and you set up the food. You set up the wine. You set up everything. And when you leave, you close the door and make sure it's locked and seal it with your own signet. So you know that you were the last person to leave this place. You set up the food and everything. But tomorrow, you're going to see that the food is gone. And you're going to find out that that, that bell is living. And tomorrow, when thou comest in, if thou findest not that bell hath eaten up all, we will suffer death. Or else Daniel that speaketh falsely against us. So basically, if you come tomorrow and the food is still here, then then you, you can kill us. But if not, Daniel's gonna die. So they were confident in this because they had plans. Verse 13, and they little regarded it. So they, they left all oh, confident. They said, Oh yeah, Daniel's done. He's cooked. <laughs> He's trying to come for us. Yeah, it's over. For under the table they had made a privy entrance. 
whereby they entered in continually and consumed those things. So these priests of Baal, um, clearly they knew that it wasn't a statue that was eating. But they made a, a sneak, a, a, another entrance into the temple under the table. So when everybody leaves in the night, they pull up, they come and eat that food. <laughs> Verse 14. So when they were gone forth, the king set meats before Bel. Now Daniel had commanded his servants to bring ashes. And those they strewed throughout all the temple in the presence of the king alone. Then went they out and shut the door and sealed it <coughs> with the king's signet and so departed. So Daniel Daniel basically said, look, let me show you something. So he had them bring the ashes and he just, just watch, just watch. So they spread all the ashes on there and everything. He said, all right, cool. Now we've seen all this, right? Okay, set the food and let's go. So they left, they locked it. Because Daniel knew exactly what, what these priests were up to. Um, verse 15, now in the night came the priests. Now remember, the night came the priest, right? So if the, the them priests, they had experience in this. They knew exactly where to go, how to find the food and everything. But it's nighttime. So chances are they didn't see the ashes that were spread over there. Right? It's night. They're not going to come and light up the whole room and everybody knows that, hey, somebody's in here. So they're sneaking in there. Verse 15, now in the night came the priests with their wives and children, as they were wont to do, and did eat and drink of all. So just like they usually do, they pulled up, they came and they had that, they, they feasted, they tore that food up. In the morning, be time, the king arose and Daniel with him. So right in the morning, they all got up, hey, let's go, let's go check it out. And the king said, Daniel, are the seals whole? And he said, yea, O king, they be whole. So nobody has broken the seal, means nobody broke into this temple. And as soon as he had opened the door, the king, the king looked upon the table and cried with a loud voice, Great art thou, O Bel, and with thee is no deceit at all. See, I told you, hey, hey, you brought this upon yourself, man. I told you he was living. But remember, keep in mind, the second he opened the door, the first thing he looked at was the table. He said, ah, the food ain't there. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Then laughed Daniel, because <laughs> Daniel saw that his trap had worked. When Daniel came up in there and opened the door, <coughs> the first thing he was looking at was not that table. He was looking at the floor to see, did, 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 you know, exactly what he thought was going to happen. He confirmed it. The, the king, all he cared about was, hey, is the food going or not? So this is why Daniel is laughing. He's like, yo, oh, man. So it says here, then laughed Daniel and held the king that he should not go in. Why? Because the ashes were spread on the floor. So he didn't want the, if the king went and stepped in it without looking, he would, he probably would mess up or cover the, the footprints. So he stopped them at the door. He said, oh, hold on, hold on. Look down here. And said, behold, now the pavement and mark well those footsteps or whose footsteps are these? So he said, now look over here. Remember we spread ashes over here, right? You see these footsteps? What footsteps are these? And the king said, I see the footsteps of men, women, and children. And the king was angry. Oh, hell no. These, oh man. Oh, these guys are so dead. And took the priests with their wives and children and shooed him, uh, who shooed him the privy door. So when he commanded them to come over here, they were like, ah, shit, they got caught. So they revealed it. Yeah, we, you know, we got a secret door right here. This is how we came through. And oh, man, where they came in <clears throat> and consumed such things as were upon the table. So they, they were doing this for a long time. Then the king slew them and delivered Bell into Daniel's power, who destroyed him and his temple. He said, hey, you know what? You go ahead and do what you got to do. He said, hey, break that shit down. <laughs> Verse 23. And in that same place, there was a great dragon where they, they of Babylon worshipped. So they had this idol, this statue uh, bell that they worshipped. And then they also had this um, this dragon, you know, that they, uh, <clears throat> they also had this, this dragon, which this dragon wasn't a, a, like a, you know, Game of Thrones type looking dragon. This is, chances are like a big ass lizard, you know, maybe a Komodo dragon or something like of that sort. But it was actually alive. It says here, and the king said unto Daniel, Wilt thou also say that this is this is of brass? Lo, he liveth. Look, it's alive. 
he eateth and drinketh, and canst not say, or thou canst not say he is no living God, therefore worship him. So the first one, okay, I understand, but this one is alive. Look, he's eating, he's drinking. You can't say it's, it's not it's not alive. So now you got to worship him. And that's why the name of the book is called Bell and the Dragon, right? Because these are the two idols that they, um, at least the, the two things that these Babylonians were worshiping. <clears throat> Uh, verse 25, then said Daniel unto the king, I will worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But give me leave, O king, and I shall slay this dragon without sword or staff. The king said, I give thee leave. Oh yeah? Go ahead. Then, because remember, if this is a god, <laughs> then there should be no way that Daniel can kill this god without, with, uh, without staff or anything. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and did seethe them together and made lumps thereof. So he, he boiled it together, you know, the pitch, the fat, the hair and all that. It probably was you know, whatever, you know, Daniel probably understood whatever was going to come of that combination would be probably poisonous, right? Or at least to this specific kind of animal. It says, and he put in the dragon's mouth, uh, uh, this he put in the dragon's mouth. And so the dragon burst in sunder. And Daniel said, Lo, these are the gods he worship. And there, just like that, the dragon was dead. You know, he killed it. Now, um, burst in sunder, I mean, it, chances are, like, the, the, the dragon probably didn't just, like, explode, you know, but maybe it, it just, like, you know, whatever it consumed, being poisonous, it probably maybe was, like, causing ruptures inside of it, bleeding, coughing blood or some shit like that, but eventually it died. Okay, that's the point here. Um, and Daniel proved the point. Look, <laughs> the thing is dead. I thought it was supposed to be a god. Verse 28, When they of Babylon heard that, they took great indignation and conspired against the king, saying, The king has become a Jew, and he hath destroyed Bel. He hath slain the dragon and put the priest to death. This guy's wallet. Now, a bit of context here is, remember that the, 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 um, <clears throat> the citizens of Babylon, okay, um, at this point in time, they were, they were, you know, they were a mixture, right? You had like, uh, I think you had like uh, um, Amorites and, and uh, Kassites and Cushites and all of them in there. And even, even um, uh, uh, you probably even had some Assyrians and so on and so forth in there. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar and them were ruling, they were Assyrians, but they were ruling over this, this, these people. Okay, so when the uh, when when the, the the Persians came in and took over, all that happened was a switch of authority. Now the, these inhabitants they welcomed actually the uh, 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 <laughs> um, Cyrus, you know, when when they had taken this down. I believe you can read about it. I forgot. Let me see if I can pull up. Um, Fall of Neo Babylonian Empire. Uh, let's see, aftermath and legacy. Is it this one here. Mm. Okay, it says here, the early Achaemenid rulers had great respect for Babylonia, regarding it as a separate entity or kingdom, united with their own kingdom in something akin to a personal union. Uh, okay, it says the region was a major economic asset or economical asset and provided as much as a third of the entire Achaemenid, Achaemenid Empire's tribute. Despite Achaemenid attention and the recognition of the Achaemenid rulers as kings of Babylon, Babylonia resented the Achaemenids like the Assyrians uh, had, had been resented a century earlier. Okay, okay, okay. I'm trying to see if I can find that here. Uh, oh, okay, this this goes this goes way after, but um, yeah, you can look into it. You'll find it, <clears throat> and basically find out that when um, when when this place fell, you know, they basically welcomed, <laughs> uh, uh, um, they welcomed uh, uh, Cyrus and the Persians because they the the na the Babylonians, I believe, their native god was Marduk. Okay, which is at least one of their 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 uh, main deities, and you'll notice that some of the names of the the Babylonian kings, like Amel Marduk, is it's it's um you know it was after the names of this god. Now 
the last king, which was Nabonidus, actually served or or honored a different god, which was um, Sin. All right, I think it was it was Sin might have been uh, the moon god, might have been the Assyrian god or whatnot. Nevertheless, the people weren't too happy with him anyway. You know, so they they've they've welcomed. The, you know, the new rulership, they're like, all right, yeah, you know, it is what it is, you know, we'll go ahead with it. And now they're like, and now you done, you know, you done come up in here, you've killed our priest, you killed our idol that we served, and you went and slain the dragon too? No, nah, you're tripping, you're doing too much now. Verse 29, so they came to the king and said, deliver us Daniel, or else we will destroy thee and thine house. Now when the king saw that they pressed him sore, being constrained, he delivered Daniel onto them. So he didn't want to, but he's like, ah, it doesn't look like I have an option, man. Who cast him into the lion's den where he was six days. So they basically threw Daniel into the lion's den. Now, yes, this, this, this was the second time Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. The first time Daniel was thrown into the lion's den was under the reign of Darius, which, which Darius the Mede, which we know what well, reading of in Bell and the Dragon transpires after that. And uh, during the time of Darius the Mede, Daniel was thrown in the lion's den because he broke the, 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 the law which said you can't pray or seek petition from any other god. And he was in there for one day. Okay, which we read about. Let me see if I can find the account there. Um, yeah. Daniel 6 and 16, then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Right now at this point, this is Darius the Mede. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his a palace and passed the night fasting neither were instruments of music brought before him and his sleep went from him then the king then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste onto the den of lions and when he came to the den he cried with a lamentable voice unto daniel and the king spake and said unto daniel o daniel servant of the living god is thy god whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the, the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So Daniel was basically taken out of the den and uh, those, the others were thrown in there, right? This is a different account than the one we're having here. Because at this point, he was thrown in there for six days. Okay. Verse 32 and in the den. So it goes to show you that uh, feeding, being fed to lions was probably one of the uh, one of the ways of punishment or execution that they, they, they had back then. And in the den, there were seven lions and they had given them every day two carcasses and two sheep, which then were not given to them to the intent that they might devour Daniel. So they, they, they took precaution to make sure we're going to make sure that there's no chance that he lives by the lines being full or no, no no we want him to be hungry so when we throw Daniel in there they gonna rip him limb from limb now there was a jew uh there was in jewry a prophet called habakkuk who had made pottage and had broken bread in a bowl and was going into the field for to bring it to the reapers now so basically, Danny was now in the lion's den, and the scene switches. And in Jewry, which is which is referring to Jerusalem at this time, remember when the Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem, they still left some of the the, the poor and the people on the land to basically like till the land and so on and so forth. So not every single Israelite was taken captive to Babylon. And so, um, <clears throat> as it says here, Habakkuk, which was one. One of the, the, the men that was left there, he made pottage, you know, like I said, he prepared some a meal and he was going into the field to bring it to the reapers. The reapers are the ones who would basically during the harvest time, they would be reaping, they would be, you know, uh, reaping the, the harvest, cutting the cutting with the sickle and binding the sheaves and all that good stuff. So he was basically taking food to them. 
But the angel of the Lord said unto Habakkuk, Go, carry the dinner that thou hast into Babylon unto Daniel, who is in the lion's den. So as he's on his way, angel pops up, you got to take that to Daniel in Babylon. Now, <laughs> and Habakkuk said, Lord, I never saw Babylon. Neither do I know where the den is. So I wasn't part of those that were taken to Babylon. I've never been there. And and even if I was, how am I, I don't know where the den is. <laughs> he just pull up and say, take this food to Daniel in Babylon in the lion's den. I'd have no idea where that is. Then the angel of the Lord took him by the crown and bare him by the hair of his head. <laughs> and through the vehemency or the vehemency of his spirit, set him in Babylon over the den. So basically, he kind of like teleported him. He moved him extremely fast from, from, uh, from Jerusalem to Babylon, just like that. So the angel, <laughs> that angel didn't come to play. He got his instructions, get the food to Daniel. He came there, he said, you got to take that food to Daniel. I, oh, I haven't been there. All right, you know what? Grabbed him by the hair and then boom, in an instant, now he's over there uh, in Babylon over the den. And Habakkuk cried, saying, Oh, Daniel, Daniel, take the dinner which the Most High have sent thee. So Daniel was probably praying while he was in the lion's den. Six days. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, the lions might not eat me, but shit, I, the, the hunger might. <laughs> so um, so the Lord, the Lord answered his prayer via an angel, you know, sending Habakkuk to bring him food, to bring him that dinner. And Daniel said, Thou hast remembered me, O God. Neither hast thou forsaken them that seek thee and love thee. So Daniel arose and did eat. And the angel of the Lord set Habakkuk in his own place again immediately. Now, to travel from Jerusalem, right? Let's pull up a um, Neo-Babylonian Empire map. Let's take a look here at some images. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you could do this right here. So... If you look at Babylon over here, you look at Jerusalem over here. Um, by the time, if, if Habakkuk was to try to get there by mule or camel or foot, by the time he got there, Daniel would be dead. Okay. But the angel grabbed his ass and whew, all of a sudden, in an instant, he was here. Gave him the food and immediately whew, he was back where he was. Okay. Today we call that teleportation. <laughs> And I mean, the angel did something similar with uh, Philip, too, when you read in the book of Acts. But anyway, um, uh, verse 40, upon the seventh day, the king went to bewail Daniel because he, he just knew Daniel was dead at this point. <clears throat> and when he came to the den, he looked in and behold, Daniel was sitting. Then cried the king with a loud voice. Now, keep in mind, <laughs> when, when the scriptures say that this person cried with a loud voice or X, Y and Z, you got to imagine that it's not like he just looked because if you imagine you are this king you are cyrus and daniel because cyrus loved daniel he was like yo this guy you know he's wise he's like he you know i like him and he's now in the lion's den cyrus didn't want to do it but he had to because the people were revolting so he's now thrown in there and cyrus just knows six days in the lion's den the lions haven't been fed yeah, he's, he's done, man. He's, he's, he's gone. So he came there expecting bones or something. Maybe uh, his hair and some his skull and his clothes, you know. And he sees Daniel sitting there. He's, what? <laughs> what? What? You know, so like, he cried with a loud, whoa, sh wait, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, as it says, uh, great art, art, <clears throat> great art, Lord God of Daniel. And there is none other beside thee. So guess what? When when um, Cyrus saw this, he believed. It didn't make him an Israelite. It definitely didn't make him of the elect. But it was just a, 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 a record to show him that, oh, shoot, this God that Daniel served truly is that one living power. Verse 42, and he drew him out and cast those that were the cause of his destruction into the den. And they were devoured in a moment before his face. Going to show you, you know, <clears throat> ultimately, that if you put your trust in the Lord, man, you're going to be taken care of. As was the case here with Daniel um, in this in this, in this, this case, right? So that is the end of the book of Bell and the Dragon. Lord willing, this is edifying to the elect. 
In closing, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Recha Kodash. Until next time, Shalom.